welcome to today's lecture of the third international Immanuel Kant summer school here. And my topic today will be Kant on the aims in the sciences. Kant attempted to make science compatible with morality, as you know. The idea is present in different well-known contexts of his critical philosophy. First, in the critique of pure reason, he claims that he needed to, as he said, deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Without a properly critical metaphysics, we will fall back into a dogmatism concerning religion and morality that, as he says, is the true source of all unbelief conflicting with morality. Unbelief here referring to uh, religious unbelief. Secondly, again in the first critique, Kant argues that all events in nature are completely causally determined, including our actions, but he allows for a logical possibility, an entry point for human freedom. This is supposed to make room for the idea, which gets substantiated by his critical moral theory, that we can and should treat each other as free and morally responsible agents. Thirdly, Kant maintains that the two domains of theoretical and practical reason, though distinct, can be related, namely by means of teleological uh, links established, especially in the critique of judgment showing that the realm of moral freedom is realizable in the realm of nature. I shall not deal with these familiar points. Instead, my concern is with the fourth dimension of his thinking concerning the relation between science and human practice. Late in the first critique, in the doctrine of method, Kant claims that the sciences ought to serve human ends or purposes. And I quote number one on your handout, Mathematics, natural science, even our empirical knowledge of man have a high value as means, for the most part to contingent ends, but yet ultimately to necessary and essential ends of humanity. But only through the mediation of a rational cognition from mere concepts, which, call it what one will, is really nothing but metaphysics." End of quote. The relation between ends and values all, and the sciences has been mostly ignored by Kant scholars, with a few minor exceptions. However, the claim just cited leads to venerable and important questions about the function of science in human life. Can science help us to pursue our practical, especially our ethical goals? Should it? Also, should science itself be guided by practical aims or values? And if so, how? Thinkers from David Hume over the logical empiricists up to Bernard Williams in recent decades have doubted or denied that science could or should develop or pursue such goals. They usually trust the famous is-ought distinction, Hume's guillotine, as it is also called. We cannot derive ought statements, and value statements are ought statements, from is statements. They more specifically question the idea that statements about values or practical ends can be justified by science and many of them see, e see even a danger in letting practical, for instance, political or economic interests have an impact on pure scientific research. This is called the value-free ideal of science. On the opposite side are philosophers as diverse as proponents of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory and pragmatists such as John Dewey or more recently Hilary Putnam and Philip Kitcher. They usually deny that the is-ought or the fact-value distinctions can be drawn sharply. They assert that science is rarely, if ever, free of practical interests and values, and that factual claims presuppose normative claims. There is a wide-ranging dispute about these two opposite views in current philosophy, with implications for the relations between science, ethics, and society. My aim is here to show, by reconstructing the Kantian position, that these views need not be incompatible. Kant subscribes, as everyone knows, to the is-ought distinction, allowing him to distinguish, for instance, between logic and psychology or ethics and anthropology. And he also allows for connections between facts and human ends in science, and importantly, argues for the rational character of those ends. Also, I will argue. Let me prepare the further considerations by outlining four central Kantian claims. First claim. Kant claims that science should serve human ends. In one sense, this is easy to understand. He writes in the groundwork to the metaphysics of morals, quotation number two, 
All sciences have some practical part, consisting of problems that some end is possible for us and of imperatives as to how it can be attained. These can be called imperatives of skill. Whether the end is rational and good is not at all the question here, but only what one must do in order to attain it. The precepts for a physician to make his man healthy in a well-grounded way and for a prison poisoner to be sure of killing his are of equal worth insofar as each serves perfectly to bring about his purpose. Thus people, end of quote, thus people have contingent ends and when scientific knowledge is used to realize them, science is used instrumentally, as we can say. We use cause-effect knowledge from medicine, chemistry and other sciences to improve our technologies. In Baconian terminology, knowledge is power. Hume, who famously as well as notoriously described reason as the slave of the passion, would happily agree about this point. At this level, we are indifferent as to whether our ends are rational and good, as Kant says. We take them as givens and do not consider the moral quality of the ensuing actions. To this relatively uncontroversial assumption, as you see it is shared by David Hume and others, Kant adds his own more controversial views. Thus he distinguishes, secondly, between different kinds of ends, namely A, contingent and necessary ends, the latter of which he also calls uh, essential ends, B, epistemic and practical ends, and C, lower and higher order ends. The third point in Kant's view is that it is the discipline of metaphysics that has to identify and justify essential ends since these are the ends of reason, and metaphysics is the study of reason par excellence. More importantly, metaphysics picks out one and one only as the highest end of reason, which Kant identifies with wisdom, eyesight. The sciences ought to serve that end. And the fourth and final Kantian claim is that he maintains that metaphysics must determine this necessary end through, as he says, the path of science itself, durch den Weg der Wissenschaft. These added claims require discussion and, if possible, defense. I will describe why and how Kant introduces his claims in order to then ask how ends, both contingent and essential ones, epistemic as well as practical ones, enter into his picture or his account of science. Next, I turn to his claim that metaphysics should direct science through the determination of essential ends of various kinds. Finally, I explain in what sense Kant asserts that science should be primarily directed by the highest goal, that of wisdom, and how to understand his claim that this should be done at the same time through the path of science itself. This will show how he integrates the two perspectives about the relations between science and ends or values that I mentioned at the beginning. So, First, in which context does Kant make his four claims regarding the role of the ends in sciences? And what is his interest in making them? Our central body of text will be the so-called architectonics of reason in the doctrine of method of the first critique, a late chapter, therefore. Here, Kant tries to explain in a rather general manner what science is and how to bring law and order to the plurality of the science, how to classify them. Against the background of this explanation, he focuses on the task of classifying specifically all kinds of rational knowledge, Vernunft Erkenntnis, or of metaphysics. He provides a systematic classification of metaphysics and its subdisciplines and relates them to various special empirical disciplines, insofar as necessary. As we will see, the doctrines presented in the Architectonics chapter are further enriched and applied in other writings of Kant in the critical period. So, Kant characterizes architectonics as an art of systems or of making systematic units of po knowledge possible, which is what, in his view, the sciences are. Two main aspects have to be held apart here. On the one hand, he repeatedly claims that no one attempts to establish a science without having an idea upon which to base it, as he says even if that idea is at first grasped in only vague or confused ways and thus has to be clarified as research develops over time. The idea of each science is connected to modes of systematizing 
our manifold of cognitions by means of the system of categories and principles of the understanding and ideas of, and maxims of pure reason used regulatively as explained in the appendix to the transcendental dialectic. And also by more domain-specific conceptual structures, such as the application of the categories to the concept of matter in the metaphysical foundation of natural science, but also by the more specific taxonomies of concepts and laws in the empirical sciences. The resulting order can be called the internal systematicity of science. On the other hand, Kant stresses that we do not, as he says, enhance but distort sciences if we allow them to trespass upon another's territory, end of quote. When we permit such trespassing, quote again, none of the sciences can be thoroughly dealt with in a manner that suits its nature. That's from the prolegomena. We have to determine the boundaries of each science and by thus promoting to avoid potential conflict, make it possible that all sciences make progress. Ideally, he says, an architectonic mind aims to reach a complete system of all the sciences, whereby we understand how logic, metaphysics, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, medicine, geography, cosmology, anthropology, history, law, and so on, stand in well-ordered relations to one another. Remember here again his claim that logic differs fundamentally from psychology despite having the same subject matter, human thought, or that ethics ought to be distinguished from anthropology despite having the same subject matter again, namely human action. Or again, his claim that metaphysics differs from mathematics, even bo though both are rational sciences, they use different methods. An architectonic thinker, accordingly, is one who, as Kant says, methodically recognizes how all the sciences are connected and how they mutually support one another." End of quote. This property may be called the external systematicity of the sciences. Goals or ends enter Kant's account of science primarily at the level of in external systematicity, at the level of defining sciences and separating them from one another. Then, as will become clear, they also indirectly shape each science's internal systematicity, each order of knowledge contained in a science. Finding the proper definitions of scientific disciplines is itself a task of reason, of reasoning properly about how to differentiate each science from its neighbors. But how do ends actually enter into this picture? In Kant's view, the definition of any science can be given in terms of several differentiating features. Thus, at the beginning of the prolegomena, Kant asks how metaphysics can become a science, quotation number four. He says, if one wishes to present a body of cognition as science, then one must first be able to determine precisely the differentia it has in common with no other science, and which it is therefore its distinguishing feature. Otherwise, the boundaries of all the sciences run together and none of them can be dealt thoroughly according to its own nature. This distinguishing feature of science, Kant explains, may consist in, quote, a difference of the object or the sources of cognition or the kind of cognition or several, if not all, of these things together. This is again from the prolegomena when Kant is discussing the nature of metaphysics. So two differentiating marks are the characterization of its ontological domain, the subject matter, and its methodological or epistemological peculiarities, its method or kind of cognition. As Kant makes clear on other occasions, ends also play a crucial role for the definition of the sciences. He famously states, quote number five in the first critique, whether or not the treatment of the cognitions belonging to the concern of reason travels the secure so, so course of a science is something which can soon be judged by its success. After many preliminaries and preparations are made, a science gets stuck as soon as it approaches its end. Or if in order to reach this end, it must often go back and set out on a new path. Or likewise, if it proves impossible for the different co-workers to achieve unanimity as to the way in which they should pursue the common aim. Then we may be sure that such a study is merely groping about, and as he continues, can't be scientific. 
So success in scientific progress is a teleological affair, depending as it does on reaching certain aims and goals. If they are constantly missed, the field is not even properly a science. Furthermore, in the metaphysical foundations, Kant fully declares that axiological features, I am borrowing here language from the philosopher of science, Larry Lauden, can be important for defining the sciences too. Vote number seven, it must be, I'm sorry. It is permissible to delineate the boundaries of a science not merely according to the constitution of its object and the specific mode of cognition of its object. Here you see him taking up the quotation I gave before from the Prolegomena, but also according to the end that is kept in view as to the further use of the science itself." End of quote. So ends, Zwecke in this context, can be just as necessary for the definition of a science as the determination of the constitution of the object, as well as the specification of a suitable mode of cognition. One can furthermore see from the context of this passage that the end of any special science need not always be a practical one, as one might suspect. Natural science, Kant says, aims primarily at extending our natural knowledge, which it does by means of observation, experiment, and the application of mathematics to external phenomena. Some philosophers, of course, wish to put natural science to further external use, Kant writes, here exemplified by the service to religion and morality. One can actually find such passages even in Newton. Clearly, such goals are not merely epistemic ones. We will have to discuss this closer as we go on. So to sum up what we have achieved so far, Kant identifies three features, ontological, epistemological, and axiological ones, as central to the definition of any given science. We will see that and how they are interrelated and can be rationally improved and are supposed to create law and order for an ideal system of the sciences. This is the first step of Kant's dealing with ends in the sciences. I want to talk about essential ends now. If Kant only claimed that science is driven by ends, then his view might come down to the first of the four claims mentioned at the beginning. It could reduce science to an instrument for external ends. However, he asserts also that the sciences would not develop architectonically if we considered only how an area of cognition can serve arbitrary external ends. Be it building fortresses, developing drugs, or guiding human beings in their social life. Such goals are not themselves unreasonable, but an architectonics has to build each scientific system from, as Kant says, a single a supreme and inner end which makes first possible the whole. And this also contributes importantly to distinguishing, as he says, such a science from all others with certainty and in accordance with principles. This is back in the architectonics. We need to gain, therefore, a better understanding of the metaphor of architectonics, which involves several assumptions. Quote number seven. Here Kant declares, what we call science, whose schema contains the outline and the division of the whole into members in conformity with the idea that is a priori cannot arise technically from the similarity of the manifold of the contingent use of cognition in concreto for all sorts of arbitrary external ends but arises architectonically for the sake of its affinity and its deprivation from a single supreme and inner end, which first makes possible the whole. Such a science must be distinguished from all others with certainty and in accordance with principles, as I said. So inner or essential ends help to define the special sciences, but are also necessary for organizing them in a system of the different sciences. This is the second of the four claims I outlined at the beginning, or more precisely, part of it, since we do not know yet whether such essential ends are cognitive or practical. One might claim that Kant must have practical ends in mind, and some have done that, but I think, and I want to argue, that this is doubtful. What examples of ends are on Kant's mind? Since he moves somewhat freely between ends and ideas, of reason, it is pretty plausible that he primarily thinks of the ideas of reason, for instance, those of God, the world, and the soul. Such ideas functions as, function as goals when they are used regulatively. Thus, the idea of a simple soul directs the unification of psychological knowledge. The idea of the world as a whole guides cosmology, and the idea of God guides theology. 
Such ideas give us guidelines for integrating cognitions into systematic wholes under common notions. Kant does not think just about these three ideas. First, other disciplines are in need of ideas of reason too, of course. For instance, he speaks of the idea of universal history or claims that no one before him has developed the idea of anthropology that he himself proposes, namely that of a pragmatic anthropology. Both of these ideas involve the idea of freedom, but in different and complementary and thereby again separating ways. History explains how human freedom first emerged within natural settings and how we developed societal conditions that either further or impede the advance of freedom at a societal level. Anthropology, in a much more fundamental or principled manner, studies what the human being, as Kant says, as a free agent, this is from the introduction of his own anthropology, as a free agent, makes or can and should make out of himself. So different sciences need different ideas. Second, Kant claims that such ideas make possible scientific system. Each idea is necessary but clearly not sufficient to build a whole. To do their work, ideas of specific disciplines must be understood not only as higher order representations that direct the unification of cognition into systematic theories, but also be related to the methods, questions, and conceptual frameworks of the sciences. Cosmology is not simply the sum total of all cognitions about the universe, but the science that aims to provide mechanical explanations using the genesis and dynamic development of all celestial bodies in their interaction according to natural laws, supported by observations of celestial motions. Only when we spell that out do we have the real idea of cosmology. The universal history of humankind is not just the sum total of all historical knowledge attached together, but a system of selected and ordered historical facts guided by, as Kant says, a cosmopolitan perspective that is, an understanding of what forces and principle may make humanity progress towards a world federation of free republics. Logic, again, is the science that aims to identify and systematize our forms of deductive inference, guided by the justificatory task of instructing us how to preserve truth from premises to conclusions. And for other disciplines, other specifics have to be given. Sometimes these may include essential ends that we, that are not purely cognitive, as the examples of pragmatic anthropology and history have shown. Setting the essential ends of each science is a task for reason, since it involves describing and evaluating these ends in the right way. Only under this condition does science constitute a rational activity in itself, guided by its own ends for which one tries to find the right methods or instruments. Only if this task is fulfilled can we reasonably hope for the success that Kant was speaking about in bringing about a kind of inquiry onto the secure path of a science. So, uh, so, so far I have referred to ends of special sciences developed from ideas of pure reason. What ph when philosophers of science nowadays discuss cognitive or epistemic aims of science, however, they refer to goals of science in general goals that can pertain to more than one science, or perhaps even to all of them. Typical candidates are truth, significant truth, support by the evidence, probability, instrumental or cognitive uh, predictive value, or simplicity, precision, and so on and so forth. It depends on the kind of philosophy that you favor, which goal you uh, prefer. Such ends are not on the top of Kant's agenda, at least not explicitly, although truth plays a role in his views with many consequences for the autonomy of the sciences. We have seen him claiming that scientists ought to extend natural knowledge, but that is not an informative statement about a general goal, of course. More useful is his claim that any science whatsoever aims at cognitions that are systematically unified, that it aims at internal systematicity. This requires a few things, such as that theories possess a certain structure, that they are consistent and comprehensive with respect to their domain, and as shown that each science has a specific inner end and a specific inner structure. His notion of the internal systematicity is at the same time flexible, leaving room for different ways in which it can be realized in the different sciences. Logic and mathematics differ from another, and natural science differs from metaphysics as well. However, we can still say more. 
for various groups of disciplines, Kant gives characterizations about the epistemic status of their cognition, explaining himself about the achievability of ends relative to their adequacy for various subject matters and the availability of suitable methods. Thereby, general epistemic goals possess a role in his account, and that again cannot be derived from purely practical goals. Here's a simple example. Empirical theories can settle for hypothesis rather than certain knowledge, quotation number nine. He says, there are sciences that do not allow hypothesis, such as mathematics and metaphysics, but in the doctrine of nature, they are useful and indispensable, end of quote. That does not mean that all conjectures in science are equally good, since we can assign different degrees of probability to them. Nor does Kant mean that hypotheses remain unrelated to rational parts of scientific knowledge. Certain a priori conditions must be satisfied by all hypotheses for them to count as legitimate hypotheses at all, such as their conceptual or real possibility, in Kant's words, their capacity to be used to deduce phenomena from them, the elimination of ad hoc or subsidiary hypotheses. The recognition that some parts of science cannot do better than producing hypotheses is an insight about what epistemic aims can be reasonable or realistic and what requirements we ought to connect to them. On the other hand, what Kant calls rational sciences, Vernunftwissenschaften, cannot rest on contingent claims only. These disciplines, logic, mathematics, and a critically cleansed metaphysics, aim to establish necessary truths and, as Kant says, cannot rest on less. This is so because their cognitive source is reason, albeit reason in different uses. Thus, mathematics uses reason such that it constructs a priori concepts with regard to its objects, pure temporal or spatial intuitions, whereas metaphysics builds from concepts that, though a priori, are nonetheless given concepts, for instance, the concept of freedom or the concept of the word. This creates different kinds of internal systematicity. The structure and unity of logic and mathematics and their modes of reasoning differ significantly from those of mechanics or chemistry, as I've already indicated. Furthermore, scientists may reasonably differ over whether their field can or should produce more descriptions of phenomena, causal knowledge, knowledge of laws, of quantitative relations, of teleological functions, and so on and so forth. Kant often indicates that scientists or philosophers can be mistaken in their views on these issues. An example here is his claim that psychologists of his time think they could emulate physics or astronomy in developing quantitative laws, whereas, so Kant argues, they can do so at best only to a very limited extent. Another example would be that he, think, he argues against those who think that there can be a mechanical explanation of living systems. Thus, Kant maintains that the sciences do not only have each their specific essential ends developed from ideas of reason, but also epistemic aims that can apply to different disciplines. Scientists can reasonably pursue some general epistemes, epistemic ends, but not others. The better we understand a certain subject matter or appreciate what methods are available, the more we learn the epistemic goals that, of the different sciences that are realistic, and the more we can refine our basic understanding of them. There is a variety of possible epistemic goals, and the choice between them has to be made by a kind of feasibility analysis, we might say. This is another important sense in which science is a rational activity concerning ends. It is not merely instrumentally rational for the achievement of goals, but also possesses the means to reflect on the realizability and desirability of those goals, and to develop thereby the internal and external systematicity of science accordingly. Now, the architectonic of ends of sciences is in Kant's view a task of metaphysics, as we have seen in the beginning. For quotation number 10, metaphysics considers reason according to its elements and highest maxims, which must ground even the possibility of some sciences and the use of all of them, as he says. That's a huge burden for metaphysics. This is Kant's third main claim in, uh, in his account of the relation between science and ends. Does he provide an argument for it? This claim is not trivial, but I propose to accept it for the time being, because questioning it would mean to discuss Kant's conception of metaphysics, a task to be com complex to be pursued here. Also, there must be some discipline, after all, that studies the elements and functions of reason and their role for the sciences. 
Whether the, we call this now metaphysics or, as might be more adequate today, a theory or philosophy of scientific reason does not matter so much. More important is another question. How can such a theory determine and organize the ends of different sciences and thus contribute to the direction of scientific research? One way of recognizing that Kant argues that metaphysics is not a purely theoretical discipline is a way to do that. Metaphysics has important practical dimensions too, which play a role for the sciences as well. In the architectonics chapter, Kant considers it important to distinguish between what he calls a school concept and a world concept of philosophy, quotation number 11. Until now, and he refers thereby to his own text, until now, the concept of philosophy has been only a scholastic concept, namely that of a system of cognition that is sought only as a science without having as its end anything more than the systematic unity of this knowledge. Thus, the logical perfection of cognition. But there is also a cosmopolitan concept, conceptus cosmicus, that has always grounded this term, the school concept of philosophy. From this point of view, philosophy is the science of the relation of all cognition to the essential ends of human reason, teleologia rationis humanae. Thus, philosophy in its cosmopolitan concept relates all cognition to the essential ends of human reason. If we do not merely consider how a science is a rational activity defined by its own inner essential ends, nor how it might serve external contingent practical goals, but how it can serve human culture and the development as a whole, we, can, we ask what broader value science may have. Understood this way, metaphysics helps to determine the ends of the sciences by considering a essential ends of human reason in general and b how the pursuit of those ends can be furthered by the advancement of the sciences. The inner or essential ends of each science just as well as external practical ends are to be put for the tribunal of reason. Thereby the metaphysician can also help um, that we can more fundamentally reflect and refine goals of scientific research. Soon after having made this point, Kant introduces his fourth claim, namely how to do that. Metaphysics, when structuring our various contingent and essential or practical ends, must also do that in a scientific manner, quotation number 12. Thus, metaphysics of nature as well as morals, but above all the prep preparatory or propedeutic critique of pure reason, the book that he has just written, relates everything to wisdom, but through the path of science, the only one which, once cleared, is never overgrown and never leads to error. Well, that's an exaggerated claim. Only after Kant has introduced all these claims, he presents his claim, which we, I gave you as quotation one, concerning the roles of the special sciences for the pursuit of contingent as well as necessary practical ends of humanity. That's the quotation that I started uh, the talk with. In sum, metaphysics, according to its cosmopolitan concept, develops a rational hierarchy of ends, ultimately, dom ultimately dominated by a highest one called wisdom. This end, and all that uh, becomes subsumed under it, must itself be pursued scientifically, or else metaphysics will remain uncritical. So much for the picture. It might be objected that Kant is now caught in a circle and in a vicious circle. While he claims on the one side that metaphysics ought to determine the essential ends of the sciences, he also insists that metaphysics must be critically reformed on the model of the successful sciences, such as physics or mathematics, as is well known. But how could these sciences have found their secure path if that path requires that the sciences be defined properly, including the specification of ends which Kant, which Kant thinks must be done by metaphysics? This worry can be overcome by two considerations. First, in Kant's view, philosophical work on the sciences need to be done alongside ongoing research and can lead to refinements as we make progress in the sciences themselves. Reflect, reflecting on what he calls the organon, the methodological toolkit that each special science must ultimately have and use, he notes that while such organons are often presented at the beginning of major works or textbooks in science, historically they are arrived at only at highly advanced stages of research. 
This is so because, and I quote, the objects under consideration must already be known fairly completely before it becomes possible to prescribe the rules according to which a science of them is to be obtained. That is, we must first have a critical mass of knowledge in each science before we understand how we got there. We learn from the practice of science. Again, he notes more generally on the definitions given of sciences by their earliest authors, quotation number 14. Nobody attempts to establish a science without grounding it on an idea. But in its elaboration, this, the schema, indeed even the definition of the science, which is given right at the outset, seldom corresponds to the idea. For this lies in reason like a seed, all of whose parts still lie very involuted. It is too bad that it is first possible for us to glimpse the idea of in a clearer light and to outline a whole architectonically in accordance with the ends of reason only after we have long collected relevant cognitions, haphazardly, like building materials and worked through them technically, with only a hint from an idea lying hidden within us. So some scientists begin the work, which after generations may be refined in a more systematic and rational way, and that both at the level of the methods of the sciences and their definitions. Secondly, in order to solve the puzzle that I mentioned, the circle problem, one can identify at least some uncontroversial elements of what the path of the science is that can help to get the project make progress even before the ideal system of the sciences is achieved. And so avoid the circle. Kant can point to some basic rules of reasoning, such as the notions that we should avoid error, seek the truth about relevant questions, or provide the best possible evidential support for our claims. Consider formal logic again. Kant claims that logic is the underlying canon for all of the sciences, an instrument that does not help to discover new knowledge, but may be used to increase deductive coherence and to reduce inferential mistakes or inconsistencies. Beyond the logical Analysis of first-order knowledge claims, the second-order task of defining the sciences depends on logic, too. We could not argue that certain methods are suited to the realization of certain ends if we had not applied some basic logical principles, or if the definitions of the sciences have not been explicated consistently or and coherently. The full critical reform of metaphysics that create, uh, produced this kind of circle problem need not be presupposed for determining special and general ends of the sciences, at least not for getting research started, and thereby the circularity objection can be avoided. Still, another problem must be confronted. Kant wants to restrict the influence of, on external practical aims on science, and he does so by claiming that our subaltern or lower level ends must be guided by wisdom. What does he mean by wisdom here, of course? That's a huge question. How can wisdom take over the demanding task of sorting out bad ends for directing the sciences, and how can it organize the good or intrinsic ends? Well, I do not pretend that these questions can be answered completely satisfactorily. One can approximate an answer by means of the following considerations. Kant sees one element as unyielding point of departure for rational thought about science. Not only does each science result from goal-directed activities, but since we are faced with a multiplicity of ends, rationality requires that they be ordered. He considers this step to be an indispensable part of the art of constructing systems of the architectonics. Look at quotations 15 and 16, and I quote, one must inspect science for universal purposes, for and how everything is interconnected with one main purpose. That is an architectonic talent and the source of systems. Second quote, philosophy is the idea of perfect wisdom that shows us the final ends of reason. Philosophy is the science of the relation of all knowledge and use of reason to the final purpose of human reason, which as the highest, all other purposes must be subordinated to. Now it's clear that he here changes the language a bit from an architectonics to the task of philosophy in general, but the point remains the same, the demand for what one may call the hierarchy argument. Given the multiplicity of ends, a rational agent here, a scientist or a scientific community and the institutions supporting that community must critically assess those ends, partly for the purpose of sorting out bad goals, partly to decide over priorities among the acceptable ones. 
Thus, Kant views the determination of signs through, through lower level or subaltern ends as something that needs to be done in a rational way. And he moreover demands that there be one and only one ultimate end to which all others are means. The requirement of a rational hierarchization of ends too ought to be included in the path of science, which metaphysics has to use when determining the ends of all the sciences. Note that wisdom as the highest end is not simply a practical end in Kant's philosophy. That's very important. Since its function consists in the structuring and balancing of a multitude of ends, it necessarily involves a theoretical kind of rational thinking too. And accordingly, Kant actually says so. In his moral philosophy, he does not describe wisdom simply as a practical end. It is theoretical as well. He defines, quotation, uh, one of the last quotations, wisdom uh, considered theoretically signifies, cogni signifi signifies cognition of the highest good and practically the fitness of the will for the highest good. So it has two sides. Furthermore, while wisdom has a moral dimension, for us human beings, it will always remain an idea of pure reason. It cannot be cognized or realized perfectly and completely. However, as any idea of reason, it can be approximated in the same way that the other ideas of reason can be used regulatively. Of course, scientific communities and the institutions supporting them do not really integrate all the goals of all the sciences in a perfect, fully rationally reflected hierarchy. In part, they cannot do that given that the sciences are frequently remade, even at the level of their own definitions or self-understanding, as we have seen Kant admitting himself. The sciences can develop new methods, take them over from other disciplines, reconsider the territories by merging and splitting, set new standards or requirements, and so on and so forth. Yet, as a constraint, the ideal is not useless, the ideal of the hierarchization of ends. It can help to eliminate some unreasonable goals, such as external practical goals that are at odds with what morality requires, but also in essential internal goals, given that these stand under realizability conditions. Conclusion. To sum up, Kant's position regarding the relation between ends and sciences is, as we have seen, highly complex. He considers both contingent and essential, subaltern and uh, higher order ends, epistemic and practical ones, and epistemic ends of different specificity and generality. He states their roles and provides us with methodological hints for ordering and revising them. While much of science should be autonomous, in Kant's view, in its pursuit of its own specific end, there are general epistemic goals many sciences can be used to serve. And there are also practical goals, including contingent ones. But only those that are ultimately in conformity with essential ends of human reasoning, especially the highest end of wisdom. That is, any contingent use of science must be ethically legitimate. At the same time, while Kant acknowledges an important role of moral values and ends, he also maintains that those demands, insofar as they are applied to the sciences, must submit themselves to rational scrutiny as well. And finally, he does not assert that all the sciences must be treated alike when it comes to the contentious issue of how far we should let societal demands play a role in them. My aim was to explain Kant's four claims, how they hang together, and to show the more specific assumptions and arguments that he connects to them in his critical writings. The picture that emerged is one that shows us how one can both assert an is or distinction or a fact value distinction, which Kant, of course, does, and yet accept that values are important and even essential parts of scientific practice, and that moral ends can play an important role in guiding the overall course of scientific research. Kant shows us, in other words, to how to move beyond present alternatives in the debate over the value-free ideal of science. Thank you very much.